This conference will now be recorded. <laughs> All right. I think All right, everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to dim the lights in a second. Caitlin is going to talk to us today about um, the Native Village of EAX Mariculture Program. Um, if you missed her talk last week, you can uh, view it on YouTube, on our Prince William Sound Science Center YouTube page. It is up there right now. Um, and I'll give it away to Caitlin. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be back to talk about in the East program. Um, last week, I gave a general overview of mariculture, what it is. Um, specifically talking about kelp and how to grow kelp. I have a few slides that are kind of just a summary of what we talked about last week. Um, so are you guys in the mariculture world or the ocean world or what world are you guys from? No, so we are from, so I, we are from New Mexico. Oh, cool. Where there's no mariculture. No, no water. <laughs> no water. <laughs> but they, they ate kelp last night. Excellent. It's delicious. We got those. All right. All right. So um, stop me if something's not clear. I'm kind of like I said, glossing over a lot of the stuff that we talked about last week. Um, some of the concepts are going to pop up again, so if I'm not explaining them clearly, just let me know. Um, okay, we want to get some patico and try it again. Um, okay, so I'm Caitlin. Um, I work for the Native Village of EAC. If you're not familiar with NVE, um, Native Village of EAC is the federally recognized tribal government for the area. Um, they're about to celebrate their 43rd anniversary this coming May. Um, and their purpose is to create opportunities for tribal members while protecting um, lands and resources. Uh, there are an incredible amount of services that they provide um, tribal members and a lot of different things that they do. They have um, health services. They run the Alanka Community Health Center in town. Um, they have a bunch of family services, uh, subsistence food services. They also address food security needs. In the community. Um, they also have some pretty cool economic development programs, job opportunities, and job training, which is going to come back into our program because that's one of the reasons why they decided to look into mariculture. Um, and so I work for the Department of the Environment and Natural Resources. Um, we do a bunch of different things. We do ocean acidification monitoring. Um, we also have some brownfield cleanups, contaminated site cleanup programs around the Copper River Delta. Um, and one of the big flagship programs that Matt Fichet heads up is the Chinook Escapement Monitoring Program. So that's a more than 20 year study on the copper where there's crews out there all summer. Um, they get to have fun, work hard, um, work on one of these big fish wheels that's just constantly going and collecting Chinook fish. Um, the downriver uh, crews tag them, send them back into the river. They swim upstream to another fish wheel where depending on how many there are in the um, river, they'll get caught again. Um, and then Matt makes some pretty cool inferences about abundance. Um, he's also growing some other programs. but So that's the department that my program falls under. Okay, so just a quick overview of what I'm gonna talk to you guys about for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna go through a review of what mariculture is, how do you grow kelp, um, and then we're going to talk a bit about where to grow kelp and uh, why we chose where we did and what's going on with the biological oceanography of the sound. And this is all Rob's um, wheelhouse, so I'm going to be squawking back a lot of his work to him. Um, I'm going to tell you where we are growing our kelp, um, where our kelp farm is located, and how we're doing it a bit differently than anybody else in the sound or in the state, um, and how it's going. I have a little tiny bit of data to show you guys. Um, and then finally, I'm going to go over the um, Tribal uh, Youth Council's Mariculture Program. We're trying to get our um, tribal youth involved in the mariculture industry. <clears throat> so um, just to quickly review, what is mariculture? Um, so mariculture is anytime you're cultivating any sort of marine organism for food, for other products, in the open ocean, in the marine environment. This is opposed to aquaculture, which you can do in the ocean, but you can also do it anywhere on land. You can do it in New Mexico, you can do it in Kansas. So you just have a very controlled environment where you're growing your organism, okay? Um, and I do want to point out and shout it from the rooftop that thin fish mariculture, uh, salmon farming is illegal in the state and that's not going away anytime soon. So we have no interest in any sort of salmon, salmon farming. Uh, we're only looking at mariculture for shellfish um, and for kelp. Okay, so just to quickly review what we went over last week, how do you grow kelp? 
uh, where do you, what are the first steps? What are the last steps? So the very first step to growing kelp is going out to find wild kelp. Um, the rules in the state right now, uh, you have to go out and find your wild seed stock. You can't go to the store and just pick up a packet of kelp seeds. You have to actually find the live tissue yourself and send it off to a lab. And the state's being very conservative about this. So there's a rule that you can only collect wild kelp from within about 30 miles of your farm. Um, so that there's no genetic cross-contamination or anything. Um, so you go out there, you find your kelp, snorkeling, diving, however you decide to do it. Um, you send your fertile tissue off to a lab, and they grow that kelp on these tubes. These are just plastic PVC pipes that are about three inches wide, um, about 15 inches tall. And around that, um, that tube is teeny tiny, about three millimeter uh, nylon twine. So there's 200 feet of nylon twine wrapped around, 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 around that tube. And on that nylon tube is where the seed of the kelp is going to settle. And that's going to be the seed line and what your kelp is going to grow on and that you can use to plant. So this takes about anywhere from six weeks to two months. So while you're waiting for your seed to grow, you put your farm in the water. Um, here that happens around uh, end of September, mid-October. Uh, you set your anchors, you put your grow lines in the water, you get everything ready so that when you, your um, seed twine is ready to go, you can be out there at a moment's notice to put it in the water. Right. So next step is planting. So you receive your seed twine from the hatchery. Um, around here, we've been using Aleut to Pride Marine Institute, which is in Seward. Um, and you take your seed twine, you put your grow line, which is that blue-green line right there, through that tube. And you basically put your boat and gear back up off of it. And that twine just comes right off of the tube and wraps around the grow line. And now you've seeded your lines. After that, in the um, late fall, winter to the early spring, you just let it grow. One of the beauties of this form of um, agriculture is it requires no fresh water, no fertilizers, no pesticides, because that would be ocean dumping and it's illegal. Um, so it just grows in the water, which is great. Um, you do need to go and make sure that your kelp fern hasn't blown away or iced over or your lines haven't gotten tangled or anything like that. But other than that, there's no big pieces of maintenance going on during the winter time. Um, so at the end of the season, about the end of April, beginning of May, is when you go back to your farm and you start harvesting. Um, all you do is you pull the lines out of the water, you have a bunch of kelp on those lines right here, and you just whack them off with a knife. And so on this side, we can see this farmer's already done that here, harvested his kelp, goes into the boat, into a fish tip, and then on to the next tip that we're not really going to cover too much today. But product development um, is a really cool aspect of all of mariculture in the state, we just don't have enough time to get into it as much as we did last year. Okay. So uh, I just wanna quickly review and go over where all the mariculture leases are in Prince William Sound. Um, these are the leases that have been approved by the state and the feds. Um, these all aren't necessarily operating kelp farms. Um, and there are several, several more permits that are in the process right now. So if we can, Oh, um, up here towards Valdez, which is right up here, um, there's a permit that's in the works to put about a 100 acre kelp farm um, in that area. And then down here in Port Etches, there's, um, I think I counted at least three permits that are in the works right now to put a few leases down there too. So there's lots going on, but let's zoom in from the Cordova area into what's going on in the Eastern portion of Prince William Sound. Um, so there are a lot of green, rectangles. Don't forget this little one down here. Um, so these are all approved lease sites. Not all of them are for just kelp. Some of them are for oysters. So we have a few oyster farms in Simpson Bay, which is both arms of this area. We have Simpson Bay Oyster Company, Safety Coves, Shellfish, who supplied the oysters, I think, for the shuck and suck competition that we had last Friday in town. Um, and then Eagle Shellfish Country, company, which is owned by Jim Aguiar, and he's been doing it since the 90s, and he's kind of the guru of the area for growing oysters. Uh, we do have three active kelp, commercial kelp farms in the sound on our side right now. Those are um, Blue Green Enterprises. This is the first year for them growing. This is Noble Ocean's second year up here, kind of towards the head of Simpson Bay. And then down here, we have Royal Ocean Kelp Company which is growing for their second season as well. 
Okay, so all of those people picked those sites for several different reasons. Um, what I'm going to go through is our process and how we picked our site and kind of the things that we were taking into account. And I'm only going to be talking about sugar kelp. There's a lot of different species of kelp that you can grow. Um, all, the three main species in the state right now are sugar kelp, ribbon kelp, and bulk kelp. Um, bulk kelp is a difficult one. No one's really been able to figure out how to grow it, um, a lot of it. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, but different species of kelp require different um, ocean conditions. So things like bulk kelp really need a lot of salty water. Um, but basically, ocean chem chemistry affects everything in the ocean. Of course, it's going to affect kelp too. And it's going to affect where sugar kelp farms are going to go, especially where ours is going to go. Um, other things that affect um, sugar kelp farms are things like daylight. I'm not going to get too um, far down the rabbit hole with daylight. As the days lengthen, we get more sunlight, more photosynthesis happens, more growing happens. That's kind of straightforward. Um, any place where there's a lot of turbidity, you're probably not going to get great light, great growth because there's not a lot of light going through the water column. And then, of course, temperature. At every single level, at every single parameter and variable, we're going to talk about temperatures factor. Uh, we're going to specifically talk about those factors in just a second. Uh, salinity as well, uh, specifically for some of our areas up in the heads of the bay, most of those heads of bays have a um, estuarine system with a river coming out of it. Uh, in Simpson Bay, one of those arms is um, the, the Rude River's up Nelson Bay. Simpson is, which river is that? Yeah, I think it might just be the Simpson River. Um, but every bay has a lot of freshwater outputs going into the bay. Um, so for our program, we looked at places away from those areas because when you have a lot of fresh water, especially in the winter time, um, it tends to ice over. And you don't want icing on your farm because that's just going to move your buoys around where you don't want them to. Uh, we also took into account nutrients. Uh, we're going to spend a little time talking about nutrients because they're very important. Um, and in the sound, there's a lot of seasonality um, with nutrients and how available they are depending on uh, what, what time of year it is. But there's quite a bit of nutrients in the sound. Okay, um, I used this slide last week. This is just a quick, broad overview of how kelp is not a plant. Um, this is going to be important in a little bit. But just real quick, plants are very complicated. They're made up of, of a bunch of different types of cells. All of those cells have different tasks that they have to do throughout the body of a plant. Um, plants also grow in this medium, dirt. So everything that's happening below the dirt is not photosynthesizing. Everything above the dirt is photosynthesizing, and things need to travel back and forth. With seaweed, there's none of that. There are no differentiation of cells. There aren't any um, root systems. There's no leaf systems. The whole entire kelp body, or thallus, uh, can photosynthesize. Each one of those cells can basically take care of itself. Um, and those blades on the kelp that look like leaves, they're not leaves, they're very, very thin, so basically all those cells are very close to water at any point in its life cycle. So you don't have to worry about moving nutrients from the blades to the roots, because those aren't roots. That's just a way for um, the kelp to hold on to a rock or something called a hold fast. And the, if you want to give it a couple of clicks, like I said, the growth medium for plants um, is the dirt, and this entire body of kelp is always in its growth medium. It's always surrounded and bathed in nutrients. So we got to talk a little bit about oceanography so that we understand why those nutrients aren't around year round. Um, so I'm going to throw out a few words at you like um, halocline. I took out pycnocline and some of the other clines I was thinking about talking about because my I was getting bored just looking out of them. So just some basic oceanography 101. Um, up here we have a figure. It's a very simple kind of open ocean system. We have our sun in the summertime. We have our water column. Over here, we have a nice graph that's showing us temperature. So up here at the top of the water column, that's depth zero. All the way down through the water column, it's about 200 meters or so. I'm just picking that number because that's kind of the depth in the sound. So during the summertime, it's lovely around here most of the time, especially in June. Uh, we get a lot of sunlight. That sunlight is throwing quite a bit of energy into the top portion of the water column in the form of heat. So that top layer of the water is heating up. Um, we don't have a ton of um, weather events. There's not 
as many storms as there are right now. Um, so what happens is we get this basically, we get a cap um, at the very surface of the water column. And this layer right here, this division between the warm water and the cold water, that's called a thermocline. So over here, we can see at the very top of the water, if temperature is going this way, it's really warm. But all of a sudden, very quickly, we reach that cap and the water temperature starts to get colder. And that cold water goes straight down the water column all the way to depth. So all of that water below that cap is very well mixed um, and it's all very cold. And there's a lot of nutrients in it. Um, as we go from the summer and transition to the fall, the sun starts going away. If you want to get a little click. Um, we get more storms. Uh, there's more wind. There's less sunlight giving us temperature. So the temperature of the water in the top of the water column starts to shift colder and colder, and it starts to line up with what's going on deeper in the ocean. And by the time the winter comes around, we get a lot of these storms that you guys have seen. Um, all of that stormy activity and lack of sunlight has basically gotten rid of that cap on the water, and everything is nice well and well mixed. So all of that water that was down at the bottom of the water column here is now able to mix up and down throughout the water column. And spoiler alert, there's a lot of nutrients down here compared to the um, upper layers in the summertime. Okay, so this cap, this thermocline or pycnocline, because everything's based on density, um, basically removes all of the nutrients from the water column. There's, it's much more complicated than that, but just as an overview for what we're talking about here, just whenever you see this kind of layer up here, think no nutrients, nothing that can really grow that much. All right, so now we get to have some of the fun stuff. Um, so this is work done by our very own friendly neighborhood biological oceanographer, Rob Campbell. Um, he's been studying Prince William Sound since 2009 with the Gulf Watch Alaska program. Um, he's been looking at a biological oceanography of um, 12 different sites around the sound, looking at everything from salinity to temperature, nutrients, talk about nutrients in just a second, all sorts of stuff. And he even was able to dig back all the way to the 70s to um, find out what they were looking at then too. So this is some of the stuff that he found and I'm gonna relate it to kelp farms here in just a second. But here we have um, down here, our month along the bottom axis. And I made these little blocks just to remind you that this is the time of uh, when our, our kelp farms are growing. So basically October through April um, is the bulk of activity of mariculture in the sound. So if you go up from there for each of those blocks, those are the times that we really care about for kelp. What's going on up here is exactly what I showed you in the last slide. So we have temperature on the Eastern portion of Prince William Sound, our area. It's very warm relatively in the summertime. Um, starts about May, that thermocline really hits. Um, depending on where you are, it might be anywhere from you know, 40, 50 meters all the way closer, much closer to the surface. But this puts a cap on nutrients and everything that kelp likes to eat in the summertime. All right, salinity is basically a mirror image of what's going on with temperature. So all of the nutrients are down here having fun partying in the summertime while there's nothing going on at the surface, except for um, very warm water. All right, so for the growing season from about October to May, um, our temperature for kelp is, is really good. It's about 4 to 12 um, degrees centigrade, which is about 40 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Um, practical salinity units are right exactly where we want them. Anything fresher is going to uh, wreak a little bit of havoc for our, our kelp farms. Okay, so anytime I say nutrients, think of fertilizers, kelp, and basically anything that photosynthesizes in the ocean needs the exact same stuff that your garden plants need. Um, and everything that's in fertilizer. <clears throat> is basically in the water column helping things to grow. Um, so here, kelp grows the most in the springtime along with everything else. Um, the main nutrient players in the sound are nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and iron. Not going to talk about carbon. There's way too much carbon in the atmosphere in the oceans. We're not limited by carbon. Uh, we get a lot of iron from our glaciers. Um, phosphorus right now isn't as limiting of a nutrient as nitrogen is. So nitrogen is the big one for around here and the thing that gets capped off um, in the summertime. So if you go to the next slide, 
Um, so, like I was saying, uh, Rob has been working in the sound for how many years now? 14? 15? Yes. Something like that. Um, and he has 12 sites around the sound for the Gulf Watch Alaska program, and two of them are in Simpson Bay. So he has data going back to 2010 on um, what's going on in Simpson Bay. So if you give it a couple clicks, we can see one site is right here at the mouth of Simpson, and the other one is back here at the head of Simpson, right by this kelp farm right here. Um, so he gave me a quick preview of what's going on with NO3, which is nitrate. Nitrogen, just if you see that symbol, just think nitrogen, what plants need. Um, at the very mouth of the bay, we clearly can see there's a heck of a lot of nitrogen in the water. And if you click again, up at the head of the bay, there is also tons of nitrogen. So this is the same sort of graph as I just showed you with month on the um, x-axis. So up here on this side and over here on this side, those are when we care about kelp. Um, there's a lot of nitrogen in the water. And if you give it another click, we can see that we have that same kind of capping of nut nutrients, just like we saw um, with temperature and salinity. So there's really not a lot of nitrogen at the surface of the water where those kelp, those kelp farms are um, during the summertime. Okay, so with all of that in mind, um, my boss, John Whistle, and I were trying to brainstorm different places to put NVE's kelp farm. Uh, we knew we didn't want to put it all the way up in the head of the bay. There's a lot of fresh water coming down here, um, even over here and further up Sheep Bay. And looking at where the leases are, um, like I said, this isn't even the extent of all the leases that are going in around here. There's several that aren't on the map because they're still in the works. Um, blue, Wild Blue Mariculture just got their permit um, approved and are going to be planting in the fall. Um, there's several farms over here. There's another one going in here. Uh, and Alaska Department of Natural Resources has stipulated that they don't want more than one third of each bay in Alaska to be taken up with mariculture activity. So they still want 60% of the bays um, to be there for recreating, fishing, all that sort of stuff. So Simpson Bay was kind of out. We um, didn't really look too far into to seeing where we could put a kelp farm. Um, Sheep Bay, there's several uh, spots right up here that are being taken up. Um, and further up here, like I said, there's a lot of freshwater inputs um, that we didn't want to try to mess around with. So we started talking about going further and further outside of Cordoba, which just upped all of our costs, especially with fuel and also with time. You know, driving two hours to get to your kelp farm when you only have a couple hours worth of a weather window to get everything done is not an, a recipe for not having ulcers or being able to run a um, commercial operation. Um, so we went back to the drawing board. Uh, we started looking around for other opportunities. And then we started just looking in this area where we still have all of this space to have kelp farms. But why is nobody growing kelp in these areas? I think you can click to the next slide. Um, so this is one of the reasons why. So this is a what's called a catenary array. Um, this or some derivation of this is what all of the farmers in our area and in Alaska are using right now. Um, it requires kind of more shallow water, more protected areas, just like those spots we saw in Simpson Bay. Um, so this is how you grow kelp. This is what a typical kelp farm looks like. Um, you have these series of long lines that are about a football field in size on a grid. And off of each one of these long lines, you're growing your kelp. So this is what you're attaching that seed twine to, to grow to your kelp, okay? In this whole area, for a typical one of these, they're about a football field in size, and they can grow up to upwards of 2,000 feet of seed line. Does any, oh, can you go back? Oh, yeah. I just want to double check. Do you guys have any questions about this? I just want to make sure I'm, I'm giving a good overview because it's going to come up in a second. So if you were passing by a kelp farm um, and you saw it on your boat, this is what you would see. It's just a series of buoys at the surface of the water. And all those buoys are keeping the grow lines as close to the surface as it can. Okay, and if you click one more, and this is what it looks like at depth. So if you had the pleasure of going scuba diving on one of these, this is what you would see. So this is all of the sugar kelp that's growing off of those grow lines. So they're all horizontal and they're growing pretty close to the surface, okay? So 
we knew we weren't going to be able to use that system in um, the places that we were kind of thinking of. We wanted to see if we could grow kelp in deeper water where there's more wind action, there's more wave action, but we didn't know how to go about doing it. But luckily, we had a chance encounter with Oliver Bergerson from the Faroe Islands, who runs a company called Ocean Rainforest. And they've been growing kelp in the Faroe Islands since 2013. And the really cool thing about the Faroe Islands, if you give it a click, so here we are, right here. Um, this is 55 degrees north, this is 65 degrees north, and we're right here at 60 degrees north. And if you go around that circle, they're just right there too. So they're basically at the same latitude as we are. They have very similar weather in the North Sea in the winter time where they're getting lots and lots of storm. And they're also getting the same day length periods. Their oceanography is a little bit different, but we thought that maybe partnering with them would put us off on the best foot to try to grow kelp using their system. So they've developed a very cool system to grow kelp. Give it a click. It's called the macroalgal cultivation rig. And instead of having basically a football field of lines at the surface of the water column, it's just one very long main line. It's about a quarter of a mile long, 1,600 feet or so, that has all of these little dropper lines coming off of it. So the main line is not growing any kelp, but off of the main line, we have about 30 feet, about 10 meters of vertical grow line that we're growing kelp on. Um, this is a, we're trying our best to replicate a study that they did several years ago. Um, so we're trying to follow their methods as closely as possible and kind of see what we get. Um, but right now, that's what we're doing. We're growing kelp vertically compared to horizontally. Right. So it's a it's a pretty cool Sorry. system. Oh, you're fine. Um, it's made for deep water, so about 30 meters. We're in about um, 120 meters to about 60 meters. We'll go over that in a bit. Um, one long line, lots and lots of buoys, and then a bunch of anchors on the, the ocean floor. Okay. Thanks. And so um, this is a picture from Ocean Rainforest when they're pulling their, their kelp out of the water. So this right here is the main line. These are, these are those dropper grow lines, and then here's all the kelp that they have gotten. Um, off of those lines that they're about to harvest. That's a lot of sugar kelp. Um, so, long story short, uh, we were able to work with our local uh, Cordova Districts Fishermen's United to see where we could put our farm. Uh, we didn't want it to interfere with any commercial uh, fishing operations, so we selected this spot in Sheep Bay. Um, it's got a rocky bottom. Stainers don't want to get their nets caught up there, um, so that seemed like the best place. And if you were to go there and take your drone out and fly over, this is what it would look like, right? So we have just that one long main line, these buoys right here on the ends, those are where the anchors are, um, and then those big bright mooring buoys on each one that kind of attach and hold everything together. Okay, so I'm gonna go back through this summary, but for what we did um, this year and this fall. Um, so what process it looked like for us. Um, and finally, we have some really cool pictures and some data to share with you guys. So this is the actual story of what happened. Um, so we had to go out and collect our own wild kelp. Uh, what we were looking for is called sori. So this is a blade of sugar kelp, this dark patch right here. Uh, that's kind of analogous to a flower in a plant. Um, they're not really that pretty, but I think they are, they're very cool. Um, so this is where all of the that fertile tissue, those spores are gonna come from. So. We had our trusty Eric, who's one of the technicians on the um, Chinook Escapement Monitoring Program. Uh, he was able to hang out with us for a bit and help us out. We got him hooked into some snorkel gear. Um, myself too. We um, also partnered with um, Royal Ocean Kelp Farm and Noble Ocean Farms um, to go out on a very beautiful mid-September day at a minus two foot low tide um, to a sugar kelp, split kelp patch, um, basically about 10 miles away from town or so. Right, so this is what we're looking for. This is our cooler that we loaded. I think I have some just more fun pictures of that morning. Yep, so um, this is the Myrmidon. This is uh, Royal Ocean's Taya Thomas's boat. Here we are in the water. I got real cold real quick. So I was just kind of scooting around on the rocks, finding as much as I can. Uh, it took Eric a little while to um, figure out the whole snorkeling thing, but we did, <laughs> we had a, a great turnout and uh, we were able to find all the, the kelp and sori tissue that we needed. And then we even had the opportunity to go to Alutic Pride Marine Institute in Seward to actually grow our own seed. 
Um, this is Dr. Alicia Seifer from here, from the Prince William Sound Science Center. Uh, she was able to get some funding to take us all to see how it all happens. Um, I hope she will show some pictures and give a talk up here at some point about this. I'm going to throw her under the bus for that. But here she is um, cleaning up some, uh, this is ribbon kelp, sori, fertile tissue. Um, and so we cleaned it up. Uh, we got rid of all of the stuff that was growing on top of it, put it in the sunlight to inspire it to release its spores, and it did. Um, and this is what we got under the microscope. So all of these little specks, those are the spores from um, the kelp that'll grow into big, happy, uh, hopefully healthy big kelp later. And then here, these are the, um, those tubes I was talking about, those PVC tubes with the seed twine wrapped around them, happily growing in the tanks in um, Seward. And here's a zoom up of what you would see when it was mature. So you can see those tiny little kelp blades just starting to grow on that seed twine. This is just a great picture of everyone. And then I have to share that picture of Alicia. <laughs> We, we had a great time. It was it was one of those things where it's like you can read about this stuff as much as you want, but actually going and doing it, you really learn quite a bit. So it was an incredibly valuable experience. All right, so um, we got back from Seward. We had to wait for about six weeks for our kelp to grow up before it could come to us. So in the meantime, we built the farm. Um, so we installed our main line, sunk our anchors, um, put all of our buoys on. Um, and then waited for the kelp seed to uh, arrive. Um, you want to give it a click. We partnered with um, AMR, Alaska Marine Response, um, to help us with the setting of these big anchors because we certainly weren't going to be able to do it ourselves and they're the best in the business. Um, one of the things that uh, we're really pushing for our kelp farm um, and hopefully working on a program is all like there's a massive amount of used buoys, used fishing line, all of the gear that you would need for an endeavor like this is either in town or on the beaches as marine debris somewhere about 60 miles away from town. Um, so we did not have to buy any new buoys. Um, a lot of these buoys were picked up off of the beach. Uh, several of them came from longliners who are retiring and getting rid of our gear. Um, there were some things that we did have to buy new, like this um, main line. So this is that one long line, um, and it kind of looks like dirty laundry because it has all these little white things coming off of it, and I'll explain what those are in a little bit. Okay. Uh, there's Jimmy Paley, our technician, and Andy Craig, who's in charge of AMR, um, working hard putting the main line out. So this one long strand, uh, that's it. That's basically all you're going to see at the surface of the water. Um, and then there are all these buoys coming off of it to, to keep everything happy. So this is us deploying the main line. And this is what it looked like after we were done. So right now there are no grow lines on it. It's not growing kelp. It's just a big long line at the top of the water. Okay, and then this is what it looks like out of the water. So all these those little white things I was talking about before, these are called beckets. So um, this was Andy's invention and modification to the line. So we actually intertwine these uh, pieces of line that we can easily attach a grow line to or easily take the grow line off so that it's not completely and permanently attached to the main line. So it gives us some flexibility with working uh, in the area. Okay, so we set our farm up and then the seeds quickly grew. Um, they were sent here from Seward uh, and we had a big grow line party. Um, so all of the farms in the area and all the farms in Alaska, they do the work of planting their seeds on the water on their boats. Um, we had over 500 lines that were each 30 feet line, long that we had to seed individually. And we knew we weren't gonna ever get a weather window that was long enough for us to do them all at sea. Um, so we did quite a few of them here at the Science Center. Katrina was nice enough to let us use the new seawater lab um, that was empty at that point to hand seed all of our lines. So here's that seed spool, and you can see here, this is Ivy. She's our environmental um, coordinator at NBE. She's uh, pulling back that seed twine. Um, John Whistle, our director, is putting a zip tie so it doesn't fall off, and you can kind of see some of that seed twine right there. Um, I think that was a Sunday when the Bills were playing and in our teeny tiny department, all of these guys are from New York except for Ivy and I. 
So we all had to have the game on in the background. Um, and you can see us over here seeding more lines as well. Um, so at the end of the day, we had 15,000 feet of sugar kelp or 75 of these spools that we planted. Um, and just to compare what's going on at the biggest local commercial farm, um, they planted about 6,200 feet. Um, so we are growing a heck of a lot more kelp in a very small area. So our surface area um, that our farm takes up is only about a half of an acre. Um, so the question is, will it actually grow? Which is what we're kind of finding out right now. Oh, here's a couple of cool on the water pictures. So this is Ruby Dombeck. She's from Ocean Rainforest. She came out and helped us with the whole process of putting the farm in and um, putting the grow lines in. She's working with Jenny. Um, actually attaching the grow lines onto the main line. Um, we did try a couple dozen um, grow lines with our uh, seed string on the water. So we were seeding them at sea instead of in the building. We're gonna see if that made any difference. And then here's Matt and Jimmy having a fun time uh, finishing up one of the last days of planting our harvest. So you can see the main line under the water. This is a becket with a grow line attached to it. Uh, this is just a little piece of rebar that is acting as a weight on the end of the line. All right, so how's it going? Kelp is growing. Um, we've been out there twice since um, what, two weeks ago. Uh, so we're trying to go out to the farm at least once a month right now. In March and April is when things will really start growing. So I'm gonna try to get out there twice a month. Um, but like I said, we're trying to replicate this study, so we're following their methods. Uh, we're measuring lengths, widths, density, um, thickness when they get a little bit thicker because they're very thin. Um, we're looking all the way through that 30 feet of line. Um, we're skipping the first meter because we know it's going to grow really well. Um, it actually takes quite a bit of time. It takes about a half an hour to measure each one of these grow lines, and we can only do about seven to eight per day. Um, so it's just kind of a time balancing thing. So we're um, skipping the first um, meter because we know it's going to do well. Um, so we're measuring an entire meter, one to two meters, three to four, five to six, seven to eight, eight to nine, um, for how many kelp are growing. And then we're measuring the six longest kelp that we see on that one meter for length, width, length and width. Right? And if we click one more, I have some data to share. Uh, so we've only been out twice. We went out once in December, and like I said, once about two weeks ago. Um, so don't take too much away from this. If you're seeing this box and whisker plot and you're having flashbacks and PTSD from like high school uh, statistics or you're just getting really bored by looking at this, don't worry about it. This little X is the average right here. And so the take home message is this is the average growth. This is the average length of our kelp. And then there's a bunch of outliers because it's variable. It's incredibly variable. Um, so this is just the average length of all the kelp that we measured in December. And if you click again, this is where we're at a couple weeks ago. If you click one more time, it's trending upwards. So it's growing. And so what is going on with all this variation? Um, pretty super obvious because you guys have been paying attention to my talk so far. We are seeing a lot of really good gro growth at the surface of the water. Uh, not nearly as much lower in the water column. Um, I think I have another little line in there. Uh, so we're already seeing that depth dependency of our kelp, but it's only January, it's February. Uh, day length is still very short. Um, towards the end of the month, there'll be way more sun penetrating deeper in the water. Um, so we'll see how well it does. I mean, it is definitely growing, uh, maybe much slower than um, what we had hoped by now, but we've only measured twice. So we'll see how it goes. And hopefully next time I talk to you, I'll have more data. Okay, um, so what are we going to do with it once we harvest it? Uh, are we going to harvest it? Uh, so the question, we have a bunch of different questions, and this whole program, our whole farm is a research site. Uh, we have no commercial interests. We don't want to be in a situation where we're competing with um, other local farmers, which means that we get to ask some really interesting questions. Um, so what we're going to do with the kelp right now is because it's a research farm and uh, because of the stipulations of our permit, we can't sell it. A small portion of it can be used for product development. So if any of our local farmers don't wanna use their own kelp um, to develop products, you know, risk losing 100 pounds of kelp because you forgot to turn the boiler off or something because you're doing a new technique, um, they can maybe use some of our kelp. 
Uh, we do have tribal members that are interested in testing different feed and livestock products. Um, we also want to know what happens if we just leave it. Uh, there's a timing issue when you harvest your kelp in the sound and in most places in Alaska. Um, kelp is an incredibly cool um, biodiversity attractor. Uh, kelp farms or kelp uh, beds all over the planet are um, very diverse. There's a lot of organisms that live in them, on them, um, and call them home. Uh, so if you're having all this kelp in the water, those little critters are going to find it and start growing on it. Um, the timing of that varies. We don't really know much about how that works in the sound. Uh, and if you have a bunch of stuff growing on it, you're not going to want to sell that for seaweed salads. It's basically like selling lettuce that has a bunch of spiders in it. Um, so we want to study the timing um, of those little invaders and when they start growing on the kelp. Um, also, if we just leave it, does it create natural habitat um, for our local uh, fish around here? We've got a lot of herring that are not bouncing back after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Um, basically, we we're creating some nice habitat for those critters to hide in. Um, so what else will be using our kelp besides people is kind of the question. Um, we also are developing a tribal youth mariculture program. We'd like to provide opportunities for um, our teenagers to get involved in mariculture. Um, we've been trying to work with the high school. Uh, we've, we're also starting to work with the Prince William Sound College um, to create a program where students can uh, earn high school and college credit at the same time for working on these projects. Um, and this whole program was uh, started with a grant from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation which is a North American consortium um, that does a lot of really cool environmental work all around North America. Right. Um, so there's a lot of cool things that we want to do with our program uh, beyond just habitat um, and biodiversity questions. Uh, first and foremost, how well does our system work? How well does it work compared to the other methods that are being used in the sound? Um, marine carbon dioxide removal, carbon dioxide removal, CDR, um, is starting to get really big. Um, like I explained in my last talk, everything is made out of carbon. If you're growing in the ocean, you're taking up carbon. Uh, a lot of times you're taking up carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. Um, we do have a lot of ocean acidification concerns up here in Alaska. So how well does kelp remove carbon from the water column and can we take it and put it somewhere where it's not going to release that carbon back into the environment and sequester it? Um, so that is one area of research we're looking into. Uh, we're also part of the Mariculture Recon Program that the Science Center is spearheading um, to research what ecosystem services the farm provides and then what also are the other environmental impacts um, and economic impacts of kelp farming in our area. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff that happens when you feed kelp to cows and pigs. Um, in my last talk, I talked about cow burps. Um, cattle and other livestock are one of the leading um, sources of methane in the world, uh, but it turns out when you feed them a small amount of kelp, it reduces their methane emissions by quite a bit. Um, so there's a lot of really cool work going on in the country about that. So if we can supply our kelp for that program, that'd be really great. Um, also, this little guy, this is a little baby bull kelp. Um, bull kelp are pretty hard to grow on our kelp systems. Um, if we do grow it, it's a, a really good product. You know, I don't know if you guys had a chance to try Barnacle Seafoods pickles yet or not, um, but they're delicious. Um, other critters like to eat them like abalone. If you unlock how to grow bull kelp, um, you may be facilitating better abalone farms around the world. Uh, so that is one area of research we'd like to look at as well. And I think that's it for me. So if you guys have any questions. Pete, um, how are you? You showed a diagram of uh, all the current kelp farms, but one mm -hmm. caught my attention is the Bay. Yep. Well, no, it's, um, I think you might have been looking at the Windy Bay. I didn't have no, I Cordova. Was, I was looking below that. that was looking below that. Oh, um, I mean, there's one in Windy Bay. Do you want to, yeah. I don't know how easy it is to go all the way back. Yeah, I, I saw that too. Um, so were you like looking at it independently? Because there's this one right here. This is on top. That's Windy Bay. Um, did I have that one? Oh, okay. Hmm. 
<laughs> okay, right here. That's, fine. that's not a farm, that's a hatchery. That's Native Conservancy's hatchery that also gets lumped in with the permitting. So where's the hatchery? It's um at I think it's at Jim Smith's house. Okay. <laughs> it's in it's in a container. Yeah, um, that's, that's the word. Yeah, they have to truck in all of their um, seawater. But it's in a um a con connex. Connex, yep, it's like a half a connex um that they developed with APMI. Um they're at capacity, those connexes are very cool. Um, but they're limited space wise, so you can't get a ton of tanks in there, which means you can't grow a ton of sea lion. But um, all of their sea lion they're able to produce uh, for themselves for the Native Conservancy. The Native Conservancy is a nonprofit in town that um, focuses on getting um, tribal members involved in the Mariculture Institute, in industry. Sorry, it's getting late, I'm getting tired. <laughs> so, so when I want fresh kelp, I just go to the shoreline just below Hardy Bay Bridge and pick it off the beach. Could or you could support your local economy and talk I've to Tay and Sky. <laughs> yeah, they they are um, blanching a lot of their kelp, so there is a bit of processing. Um, I don't know if they have plans to make their own salads or anything. But I think they're looking into it. I have a question. Sure. So you guys seeded your lines here. Yep. How? What was your process to get it? now over there because you have a bunch of seeded lines. So we wrap them up very gingerly and put them in coolers. Okay. Um, and NVE, our department has a lot of coolers um, because of the uh, Copper River program. Um, they're shuttling food back and forth all year round or all summer long. So they have like 50, 70 big coolers that helped out a lot. Okay. Yep. So are you growing the kelp? Like what's that process like? Um, you can go back through the process, and that's one thing I didn't touch upon um, with our program. Uh, so there's the, the idea of social license in the state where um, the first several kelp farms uh, didn't want to interfere with fishing, so they took their entire farms out after their harvest season. Mm -hmm. um, so in the summertime, it was nice and open for fishermen. Um, you can maybe grow kelp throughout the summer if you take it cut it about two thirds off and leave the hold fast and a bit of the kelp blade. In theory, it'll grow back. So that's one thing that we wanna look at because we're gonna be leaving our kelp farm in all year round. But most of the farms take all of their structures out of the water um, after the harvest. So there's not capacity right now to do that. Um, and they like reuse all of the materials or is that just gonna kind of start from fresh? Yeah, they can reuse like all their lines and everything, but they have to go snorkeling every um, September and find them. See, yes. <laughs> which is actually one of the cool parts of this project. <laughs> but it is, it's labor intensive and it's costly. I mean, especially for um, commercial enterprises that are using their own money, you know, it's uh, several hundred dollars in gas. Um, some people go diving, so you need to know you need to dive experience, you need all the equipment to go snorkeling. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I know that was a lot of information, so thanks for sticking with me. All right. Well, I don't think we have any questions in the chat, so thank you, Caitlin. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Get home safe. Yeah, thank you for braving. The if you didn't sign in, if you wouldn't mind signing in on your way out. So when the line is in the water, both snow does widen the roads. Yeah, well, that, that's actually one of the reasons why.